Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to see so many of you here and to welcome you to the LSE. My name is Kirsten Sainbuch. I'm a British Academy Global Professor at the International Inequalities Institute at the LSE. And um, I am here to welcome you on behalf of the Inequalities Institute, but also on behalf of the Center for the Study of Conflict and Cohesion in Chile, COES. Um, the reason I'm standing here is because until March, I lived in Chile and was um, one of the founding board members of COES. And so I've accompanied COES from the outset, almost now until to the present. And so uh, I consider myself to be relatively up to date about what's going on in Chile, despite the fact that I now live in, in the UK and work at the LSE. Before starting, I'd like to thank our three organizers, Rafael, Hector, and Daniela, for their marvelous efforts. I can't see Daniela. Oh, there. <laughs> so, um, for their marvelous efforts in, in, in organizing this conference. Um, it's, it's been a tremendous success, I think. Um, congratulations to all of you who presented as well. I've had nothing but positive feedback about the papers that were presented and about the level of the research that was presented during these last couple of days. So well done to all of you, and um, it was a really enjoyable conference, very, very, very well organized and um, a tremendous success. I'd like to also pre uh, present our presenters tonight, uh, who are here from Chile, Emmanuel Varoset, who uh, is one of the researchers mm -hmm. of COES, and Daniel, uh, Diana Kruger, um, Emmanuel is from the Universidad de Chile, a sociologist. She can tell you more about herself as well. And Diana is from the uh, Universidad de Adolfo Ibanez in Viña. She's an economist and she works mostly on gender, econo economics, labor. labor, context of inequalities, etc. Now, the idea tonight is to have a very brief presentation uh, of about 45 minutes, no longer and then to open up this discussion to questions, etc. cetera. Um, before we do that, though, I'd like to very briefly introduce the Inequalities Institute and why we have this link between uh, COAS and the Inequalities Institute, and also to give you a tiny bit of background on COAS to give you a sort of context um, in which we can hold this debate. So the Inequalities Institute is, um, was founded in the context of the post-Piketty um, impact that his book had and um, reflects the desire of the LSE to study inequalities but from a more multidimensional perspective, multidisciplinary perspective, and at an international level as well. The Inequalities Institute has several partners in the Global South, of which COAS is one. Um, and so that's how we initially came to have a relationship. That's how I came here to the LSE. And to introduce COES very briefly, COES is a research hub funded by CONICIT, by the Chilean National Research Council. And it brings together four universities in Chile, the Universidad de Chile, the Católica, Adolfo Ibáñez, and the UDP, Diego Portales. Um, it brings together researchers from those four universities, and it was founded in the, conflict, in, in, in the context of the um, 2011 con conflicts of the student movement. So this was a time when the first Pineda administration was confronted with um, significant social protests on a scale that Chile probably hadn't seen um, for a while. And they, the government realized that this was a situation on which they had very little information where this was coming from, how it came to this, etc. And so CONICID, which is the National um, Science Council, has a program for funding research hubs on areas that are considered to be of national priority. And that's how we came to, um, to apply for, for one of those research hubs. Our main funding comes from the research hub. It's significant funding, especially in the context of social sciences in Chile. Um, we get about 18 million over the course of 10 years. So um, that's very, very significant by any uh, country's standards, but in Chile that's especially significant, and even more so in the social sciences. The idea of COES and of these programs is to not only research um, conflict and cohesion in Chile, but also to engage in the wider context of informing public opinion, forming pub informing public debate, public policy, to undertake outreach, and of course to undertake really high-level academic research. 
And COIS has now been operating for close to six years. It's been a tremendous success on, on all fronts. So really across the board, we had a board meeting today where I had the honor of presenting this work and um, it's been really very impressive. What's relevant for tonight is that COES, as a result of the conflicts of 2011, established several um, products, in inverted commas, as we could call them, to study the factors that contribute to social conflict and cohesion. So we established, for example, a longitudinal survey that measures, like a thermometer of society over time, that measures social attitudes, relationships between groups um, in Chilean society, brings together socioeconomic data, um, with, with all the other aspects that it looks at. And we now have had, I think, three waves of this survey. We're going into the fourth, so it gives us a, an absolutely unique longitudinal data set in the context of South America with which to work. So any of you who are researchers in this room and who are interested in that topic, please do go on our website and look up the um, data that COES has. The other thing that we did was we set up various observatories. So there's an observatory of um, labor strikes, for example, which for the first time brought together information on not just the frequency of labor strikes, but also who was participating, um, how many people, what kind of strikes e existed, what the issues were, etc. This is all data that's collected from, in, um, from national newspapers across the country. It's an awful lot of work to compile this information and this data, but once it's compiled, it's incredibly useful for analyzing what's going on in Chile. And because that was, that was kind of an experiment, the labor strikes, we then went on to measure conflicts themselves, um, both going forward, but also we tried to establish a historical database, on, or we're in the process of doing so, um, to try and figure out what happened in the past, the same methodology, and extremely useful information on the same sort of thing. So the number of conflicts, how many people participated, the issues, the methods, etc. We also have an observatory of uh, cohesion, which is perhaps less developed, but which, which has some key indicators. And also we have a, um, an indicator of territorial well-being. So a lot of our data is geo-referenced. We bring together administrative data from government records with survey data, socioeconomic data with territorial data, and also um, with, with other sources uh, to give a, bro a broad sort of overview of how conflict and cohesion are developing in Chile. And so what we will be presenting tonight is actually based on a more recent collaboration that we've done with other research centers, a social thermometer of what's going on in Chile. And Emmanuel and Diana will talk more about that in a minute when they go, when, when they, when they um, start presenting. Um, just finally, before they do so, I wanted to let you know um, that there are several hashtags for this event. One of them is LSE Chile. LSE Knowledge is one. And then, of course, all the other usual ones, Chile, inequality, COES, desigualdad, etc. And the final question before we start, how many of you in the room are actually Chileans? Just to give us an idea of, right, okay. And you've probably all been following current events very closely. I won't ask how many of you are on antidepressants. Um, <laughs> Hopefully, we can instill a little bit of optimism into the debate tonight. But before um, going on, I will pass the word on to Emmanuel. Are you going to start? Or Diana? Diana's going to start. And Good evening and thank uh, everyone for being here and to the organizers again for uh, this great conference. My name is uh, Diana Kruger, as Kirsten introduced me, and I'm an economist working at, in Chile. Uh, I'm not Chilean, I'm, I'm married to a Chilean, and I have been living in Chile for 15 years, so my perspective is sort of um, from within and from outside of Chile. Uh, we were, in preparation for this talk, we were presented with a couple of questions <laughs> to get the conversation started, and that is how uh, we view our panel as kicking off uh, a discussion. And 
In preparation, I thought I would um, share well, this image that most of you have probably seen uh, and the questions we were asked from our research and from our perspective. Uh, what do we view as the causes of these uh, social mobilization? Uh, and maybe at the end we can talk about possible exits to, to the current conflict. I'm not sure that, that I personally have a, uh, an idea, but uh, we, can, we can talk about that. And so in thinking about the, the information I'm going to share, I decided to call it just a snapshot. They, I'm going to be sharing information that is probably known to, to many of you if you work with any of the social um, or the socioeconomic variables produced by the Chilean household surveys. This may not be new to you, but I think that I see some uh, non-Chileans here and, and maybe some of you do not know this data. And with the idea of trying to understand what, were, what are the conditions in Chile that are not new, the data I'll be sharing is from 2017, but I, we could open a survey from 2015, from 2000, from 1996, and we would see the same picture. Uh, and in, in my view, um, the part of the, the reason that the uh, uprisings are occurring right now, the mobilizations and the protests, is because this picture hasn't changed. So uh, in the little time I had to prepare, I, I just picked the most recent um, statistics. And just so you know, the uh, paradigm under which I personally work, so you know my uh, own personal biases, is from a human development perspective, thinking that development is not just about average income or average uh, GDP per capita, but it encompasses our human development uh, in uh, education and health. So uh, let me just share some basic statistics about Chilean uh, income and employment. And this uh, graph shows information, the latest information we have from the National Household Survey uh, about um, income per capita. It's uh, monthly income. There will be some Spanglish in my, in my slides. Um, I was rushing to, to translate for today. Uh, which can help us understand, when I saw this graph was a long time ago by, our, by the current director of COES, Dante Contreras, he presented this at my university in 2006. And I approached him afterwards because I was new to Chile, and I said, so basically Chile is poor. Uh, you take out the top 10% uh, and Chile is poor. It is a country, and this is something that people who don't know Chile very well don't really understand uh, because the GDP per capita figure um, actually hinders us because as researchers we can no longer ac access uh, funds for a developing country because it's not considered developing anymore. But um, it's, it's, a, it's something that really impressed me and we can see that the median income in Chile is 400 pounds per month. So uh, this has a big impact not only on well-being but also in the future into pensions. You know, there is a lot of discussion, which I don't uh, agree or disagree with necessarily, about uh, fixing the or, or trying to find solutions to low pensions. But I'm not sure that privatization is the way, because if you earn a very low salary your whole life, and we have a private account system, then you will have a low pension. So I, I believe that the low salaries, the low wages in Chile is really the, the, the heart of many of, uh, of its problems. If we look more closely, and, and this is a, and a research agenda that, that Kirsten and I share, share um, very much, uh, if we do a dub, um, uh, put a, a, a more attention to the characteristics of people's employment, and I'm just gonna share some uh, general ones, we can see that the lower incomes um, in the distribution of Chile have much more unemployment than the upper quintiles. So again, if we just look at the average unemployment rate in Chile, which is about, depending on any given year, between five to six, seven percent, uh, we can think it's a success story. But you know, if we look more closely, there are uh, 20 percent of the population where unemployment rates are close to 20 percent, um, and these are workers that have are low skilled, have low human capital, and who don't have the capacity to react to shocks. Uh, when there is a negative economic downturn and they don't have many options. Um, and then if we look at some um, 
measures of employment quality, which, you know, there's no time to, to talk about that deeply, but uh, if we look at unemployment quality figures for Chile, we can also see that people in the lower 20%, the, the poorest households in Chile, work in precarious jobs. In self-employment, about 40%, I can't see from here, but it's about, yeah, it's about 40% of uh, the poorer households in Chile work in very precarious self-employment, uh, whereas the salaried workers um, you know, uh, are concentrated in the upper uh, part of the distribution. This is important because when there is an economic shock, and we had a very nice two-day conference where there are new measures coming up um, that are being developed uh, about economic insecurity, when there is an economic shock, workers that have um, salaries and contracts are somehow protected uh, by the, the law. Uh, if you're fired, you're given some wage compensation, but people who are self-employed do not. And Chile has, uh, is a very formal country. Most workers, even low-income workers, will have a contract, but there are different types of contracts in Chile. And some contracts actually do not have any kind of social protection uh, attached to them. Uh, and so we can see, again, this very uneven um, uh, distribution of good jobs. So the, I just want to say I'm not um, trying to claim causality here. This is just a description of the... the the picture today. So um, health, uh, which is something that uh, I think is basic for, for our lives, um, what does that look like? Chile has a mixed uh, insurance uh, system with a public system called FONASA and a private system where, with about eight or nine private uh, insurance companies. So we are under, um, I don't know what the term is in English, but all workers are uh, forced to buy into uh, one of these two schemes and 7% of your salary goes to them. The blue bars represent the public system for NASA and the red bars represent the SAPRA system. So 75% of the Chile, sorry, 85% of Chile is in FONASA, it's in the public system. And about 12% of the population is in the private system. Uh, we can see again that the private system is concentrated in the top 20% uh, of the, the distribution of income, uh, and the poorer, poorer households are basically in FONASA. So why is this relevant and what uh, does this mean? Uh, it's relevant because of the access that one has in the public system relative to the private system. And uh, health, we'll see some information later when Emmanuel presents the results from the um, social thermometer survey that, that we fielded about a month ago, uh, health and access to health is the second most important reason people are protesting after pensions. So the, um, the CASEN surveys, which is a national uh, survey, asks um, uh, people in, 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 in the questionnaire, have you had any of the following problem, uh, problems when you have tried to access health services? We can see that about 5% of the population is saying they have had problems paying for services and that it's pretty uniform across the income level. So uh, in that sense, we don't see any kind of pattern in terms of being able to pay for services because uh, FONASA is designed so that the higher your income, your copayment increases gradually. So people who have very low incomes don't have to pay anything for medical services. And the more you start earning, then you have to go up to co-payments that go up to about the equivalent of about 10 pounds uh, for seeing a specialist. But then there are other questions. Did you have a problem getting to the health center? Did you have a problem getting an appointment? Did you have problems receiving services? And then we begin to see that people in the lower uh, part of the income distribution have, re report having problems actually receiving services not only being able to get there because maybe they live in very far away areas and transportation may be expensive, but actually because they could not see a specialist. This problem uh, was highlighted a couple of years ago by previous protests um, and a number started coming out that there were many people dying waiting on waiting lists trying to see a specialist. And there was a presidential commission to study the wait times in um, 
you go to, in Chile, you go to a primary healthcare facility if you're in FONASA, and then you're referred to a specialist. And there are many, um, there's a list of about 85 illnesses that the government is mandated to cover for you at zero cost. So that's, you know, it's a great step uh, in terms of, of health coverage, but the problem is that people have to wait up to a year to see a specialist. So if you're sick, um, you know, that's not uh, such good news. About half of these uh, referrals for a specialist were resolved in time during 2016, and about half did not get resolved. That means that people had to be put on a waiting list. Um, this is information from the 2016 Presidential Commission to study the wait times for FONASA. The average wait times to see an appointment with a specialist is 300 days in, under the public system, and to have like a procedure like an x-ray, it's a year and a half, and to uh, have surgery, it's about a year. Okay, so this is um, the situation right now. Uh, not in my presentation is something about the cost of medicines, which is another reason people are protesting, and uh, pharmacies have been a target during the recent uh, protests because the cost of medicine is extremely high, and Chile has very uh, colluded markets in a lot of industries, and pharmaceutical labs are colluded. They charge the government uh, one price and private pharmacies another where a lot of people get their medicines and the difference is um, I believe I heard the uh, one of my colleagues say that if they charge the government 100 they will charge the pharmacy 1,000 or you know the margin is huge the markups for pharmacies can I just add something to this slide? yes um, I think one of the big issues that's coming out with the current protests is that the people who are in the circle and who are waiting for a long time for appointments, what they end up doing is they end up going into the private system and paying for services out of pocket because these wait times are too long. The problem is, of course, with wage levels, you have to go into debt to do that or you don't have many reserves in order to cover for those costs. And so the big issue here is one of the problems that we're seeing in Chile again and again and again, um, and Joaquin presented a wonderful paper on this yesterday about vulnerability. The problem is when there's a shock of any kind, a health shock, an unexpected economic shock, people are very, very vulnerable and have very little to fall back on except for their families and generally go into debt in order to resolve their issue mm -hmm. and then can't get out of it. So that's motivating we don't have specific data on this in, with this survey, from this survey, but that's motivating a lot of what's going on with the protests as well. Especially when um, it's very evident that many people don't have those problems mm. when you go into um, an ISAPRE. And, yeah. and uh, so the, uh, there was a study by the United Nations Development Program in Chile a couple of years ago about uh, inequality. And uh, one of the questions that was asked was, do you believe, do you have any, what is your level of confidence that if you get sick, you will receive medical attention? And uh, people in the highest 20% are fairly sure that they will be able to receive medical proper um, attention. And it's very low in the um, lower 20%. So it's not surprising, uh, excuse me, given the long wait lists that, that are, um, that people have to, to be in. Regarding education, um, when I was getting my, when I was studying Chile, when I was in, in graduate school, it was, and maybe a little bit before, I'm a um, bit older than, than most of you, the faces I see in, in the room. Um, Chile was the, the success story in terms of education, promoting educational choice, in expanding coverage, which was the original objective of the, um, uh, privatization uh, and voucher program. It was to address lack of coverage. And it has been very successful in doing that. If we look at the left two graphs, they show um, the percentage of children in uh, the appropriate age groups that are able to attend uh, primary and secondary school. And this was the objective of that policy, and I would say it's, you know, it, it gets high marks in reaching that objective. Uh, the, the graph on the right is the, the after achieving almost universal, co universal coverage in primary school uh, access and almost universal coverage in secondary school across all income um, levels, then 
the challenge now is higher education, and Chile is not alone. There was a nice comparative study where, there she is, uh, yesterday uh, talking about this for many uh, countries in Latin America. Uh, it also shows, though, this is not a, um, I'm not showing the evolution through time. Emmanuel will share a graph later. Uh, what we see is that more uh, young people in lower income uh, households are able to attend university, especially after the uh, gratuidad, the free tuition law was passed a couple of years ago. Uh, so that is good news. The other side of the coin, the flip side, so that was like the success story. The flip side of this is that the uh, school choice uh, mechanism that was intended to increase access had uh, many probably unforeseen results at the time. One of them is that with school choice, families uh, and children in Chile are segregated from day one. This uh, uh, graph that I, that I prepared shows uh, the darker the blue, the higher income you are. And it shows that in the private schools, which are the ones that for, perform better academically, um, children are mostly from the upper 20% or 30% of the income distribution. And the reverse is true for municipal schools. In uh, about 10 years ago, a policy was implemented giving more money to children who were more vulnerable. And what families did with that money is take their children out of public schools. So the segregation in the public school system or in the whole entire uh, school system has increased uh, in the past years. So we can understand why segregation is also playing a role, I believe, in, in resentment and in seeing that um, you know, I am totally left out of the, for, for people in the lower 20% of the income distribution, they are totally left out of what is perceived as the benefits um, in the country. And I just wanted to show one, um, one graph that, that shows what happens at the end of this education um, system. This is actually results from the fourth grade standardized tests in math and language. And there are several statistics that are, that are prepared, but this shows what percentage of children do not have adequate levels of math and language in fourth grade. And um, in fourth grade, it's a critical moment in the education uh, period because after fourth grade, it's very difficult to close these gaps. It's very costly. The first four years of primary school are critical. And we can see that about half of children in the lower 40% of the income distribution have deficiencies by fourth grade, by the time they are 10 years old. Yes, and um, in both language and math compared to 11% in the higher income groups. Again, this is not causal. These are different children with different parents, different human capital levels, um, and they're going to different kinds of schools as well. And the flip side about the, the um, increase in access to education, and this is uh, 2017, Gratuidad was just starting the free tuition um, law in Chile. Um, but we, there was a question that asked um, young people attending college, do you pay for your college tuition? And so the left, the blue graph um, shows that the higher your income, the more you are paying per month for, for a college education. And then they ask, well, do you have debt after you leave college? And about 40%, 80% of college students, no, sorry, in the... Uh, Lower 80% of the distribution, 40% of people will graduate with debt. I uh, did not have information about the amount, uh, and 25% of the higher income group will not have debt. And this is another major, major driver of the protest today. Okay, I will pass it on to Emmanuel. Uh, good evening. My name is Emmanuel Barroze. Um, I am French and Chilean, and I've been living in Chile for now 20 years. So, um, and I'm a, sociolo I'm a sociologist, so I'm interested in the uh, processed parts. But we need to know these structural information and data to understand uh, why the crisis is so profound, because it comes from uh, many years ago. And we wanted to share this uh, graph because it shows one of the main problems we've had in the last uh, years, which is it's good news. As you can see, this is the inclusion in the higher educational system in Chile 
from 1985 until around 2013. And as you can see, it's been an explosion. I mean, it's more intense than in Europe and in uh, North America in the 1960s. But the problem is that in the case of Chile, we didn't have, and Kirsten will talk about it, uh, a change in the productive system. So we are producing lots of uh, new uh, and well-qualified uh, uh, persons, technicians, and also people from university. But uh, during the last two, five, four years, they just don't find a job at the level they would expect. So the 2006 uh, mobilization with high school students has a relationship with the 2011 uh, uh, student protests. And the protests we have nowadays are almost the same people because it used to be the high school students, then the university students, and now the young uh, workers who don't find uh, the job they were promised that they would find. No, yeah, no. Um, so we, uh, our idea here uh, is, and Kirsten, please help me, we are trying to uh, say some things about the uh, ideas uh, most, most people have about Chile. Uh, it's uh, generally said that Chile is the laboratory of neoliberalism because the model was uh, implemented during the dictatorship. But as uh, Ben Ross Schneider, an economist from the US, I believe, would say, it's not liberalism what we have in Chile. Uh, it's a small country, and uh, what we have is familiaristic, hierarchical, and monopolistic capitalism. And so that's one of the problems we have now, and most of the scams and scandals we've had in the last years are because of the monopolistic dimension of the economic model. Um, so. That's right, we've had a huge inversion, uh, public inversion in investment in Chile about education, health over the last 30 years, uh, and poverty has uh, it's dropped. It's almost incredible in the Latin American uh, area. As you can see, the figures are really low uh, compared to uh, Latin America. Uh, but as we've heard today, uh, these, uh, the people who got out of poverty are really vulnerable. And uh, we have to remember that Chile, as many Latin American countries, depend on the price of commodities internationally. And part of the growth uh, was due to the price of copper. And the hip hyper cycle of copper, which began at the beginning of the 1990s, just after the tr political transition, uh, driven by the Ch Chinese demand. Uh, so the price of the copper was the double of what it used to be during the 20th century. And that ended a few years ago, uh, about four years ago. So that's part of the explanation also why uh, so many promises and expectations wouldn't uh, be um, completed. <coughs> So briefly, as you can see, uh, this is the evolution of public spending in health, in education, but the problem is that uh, if the uh, curve is really um, steep, uh, the accumulation of wealth in the higher part of the social pyramid was much faster. So uh, the inversion in the public system would not meet expectations, but the uh, concentration of wealth uh, was the other problem. So the level of poverty is a great success nowadays in Chile, but about only 10 years ago, we began to look at wealth concentration. And now we know that one of the main problems is wealth concentration. <coughs> Before the outburst, I think people never really thought about the wealthiest people in Chile as part of the problem. The government was the problem, but not the wealthiest uh, people. And just in one month, we discovered that part of the problem is the accumulation of wealth uh, in the higher part of the, uh, of the population. So that's another good news. The income inequality in Chile decreased over the last uh, decades. 
you can see that the curve is lower and rounder uh, as we go uh, on the um, right side, so that's good news. But uh, the problem is that that kind of development we have in Chile uh, has a lot of uh, constraints. The uh, diagnosis about malaise in Chile is quite old. I mean, there is a report from the UNDP 1998 saying that there is a problem, a real problem, in the kind of development Chile is having and the kind of transition to. 1998 is the year when uh, Pinochet was arrested here in London. Uh, and until that moment, everybody in Chile thought that we were the tigers of Latin America, not the dragons, but tigers of Latin America. And after the arrest of Pinochet, we discovered that the transition was not uh, so great after all. But the problem uh, we have, and Kirsten knows a lot about it, is that uh, the economy is based on exportation of primary commodities, mostly copper, but also salmon, wood, fruit, and uh, Chile has some success in exporting business models for retailing, uh, but there is a lack of industrial policy, and I'll let that to uh, Kirsten. Um, so, yes, apparently Chile was the oasis of Latin America, but uh, we, didn't, we couldn't get away of the ghost of underdevelopment, basically because... Uh, Income is mostly based on exportation of raw products because the working force is still largely unskilled and the explosion of uh, university tertiary formation is not good in Chile. I mean, it was driven by the expansion of private universities. Uh, so we have a problem of people who went to college but do not have really good skills, and the problem comes from primary or secondary school, as um, uh, Diana explained. Uh, well, we have a dwarf, dwarf science and technology uh, development, so uh, we don't have the means to renew our productive system. system. Uh, Kirsten will talk about it. We have the sharp inequalities we know, and we have serious environmental degradation, which is also part of the problem we have uh, on planet Earth at the moment, uh, but it's part of the uh, protest uh, nowadays, today. Um, so the paradox of inclusion in Chile is that, yes, we are supposed to be uh, developed countries, but we uh, aren't. Uh, and it's been years now uh, of rejection from the population to the, that kind of model. From 2006 on, we've had waves of protests, but there was no convergence between these protests until five weeks ago. And one of the problems uh, Kirsty knows uh, perfectly is the problem of working poor. Uh, so poverty is not just people excluded from the system. As uh, Diana said, we have a monthly medium income which is really low, uh, and with families uh, mostly with one income. As and you can see, the monthly medium income is just about the poverty line. So you work a lot, but you are almost uh, poor. And the minimum pension, which is one of the problems we have promised that the system would uh, give good pensions. Today, people uh, get a medium pension, which is around 150, 150 uh, pounds. So it's under the poverty line. So that's one of the reasons that explains also the outburst and the reason why uh, elderly people are also on the street. So, um, as you know, we've had many protests from 2011 onwards. Students, we changed the repertoire of collective action and put the uh, topic of inequality on the table, but also the movement about pension We've had historically uh, an important movement about indigenous people, and maybe one of the surprises uh, for us who live in Santiago is discovering the impact and the size of state repression. I mean, indigenous people in Chile in the south have been used to it. It's been their reality for about 30 years. But we woke up in Santiago one day with the militaries on the street and uh, with all a discourse about delinquency and, 
and social protest as violence, as delinquency. So uh, it's important to take that into account to understand why the uh, Mapuche flag is one of the uh, most representative flags in the uh, unrest uh, right now in Chile. And we've had the rebirth of feminism in 2000 and uh, last year, uh, which is against violence, harassment, and which is also a global movement. I mean, lots of the demands we have here, we can find them in many countries. But the problem is, is that the cocktail was exploded um, after years and years of social movements and no social or political solution. So the, the reasons of the outburst, I suppose many um, here know them. It was, as many other countries, Ecuador, uh, Lebanon, Iran, uh, inclus in, including French, France with the yellow jackets, the price increase, especially of fuel, um, and transportation. And it's been what uh, a colleague calls uh, irritation, irritation uh, which means abuse, but irrit irritation is the way people feel it in their daily lives. And abuse would be uh, the idea that uh, the system is done to scam and monopolize and just, uh, I don't know how to say it, uh, accaparé, accaparment, uh, no. when you just uh, concentrate the wealth. So uh, that came much before, uh, but uh, it had uh, some expressions during the second government of Bachelet and the second government of, of Piñera with little phrases of these, uh, the ministers that marked the distance between elite and the rest. So that showed that the political class was disconnected at best and arrogant uh, in, in the worst case. And there was also various abuses from the economic elite, which show the unbearable distance between a monopolistic economic elite and a workforce that feels disappointed and economically drowned, uh, not to say other things. So uh, as you know, this is what ha has happened since uh, October, uh, well, in the last five uh, weeks. The level of violence, I mean, it's not, it's, it's, we have to say something about human rights and, and, and the level of the violence and about 30 people dead and still people who have disappeared and haven't appeared, uh, rapes. And so the level of violence has been really, really high. I mean, when you think that in Hong Kong in five months of protest, there is, I don't know, one person dead. Uh, in France with the yellow jacket, jackets about five per person died. So the amount of violence and repression is really uh, higher, but we were used to it before. I mean, it's not that new. And, um, well, we'll have some time in the discussion to come back to uh, this, but uh, I would just like to show two slides, uh, or three, I will see. Uh, so people are uh, in favor of the social movement. This survey was done two weeks after the outburst. So the opinion also changes. I mean, we've had almost six uh, weeks of violence, uh, repression, social violence, and we know that that kind of outburst uh, can't happen without violence. I mean, uh, it's not new age, it's, it's just uh, a real um, transformation. So, but people are really in favor uh, of the movement. Um, and lots of people have been part of the movement. Uh, well, lots of them with cacerolazos. I wouldn't know how to translate that to uh, English. Banging pots. Yeah, banging pots. So, uh, but as you can see, uh, lots of people have participated in uh, demonstrations on the street, which is quite new and uh, interesting. And so, well, that's the words we hear uh, about uh, during the, the protest, and uh, maybe you've seen that uh, person carrying a, a cartel saying, I just don't know what to ask for because it's so many things. Um, and uh, as uh, Diana said, uh, one of the main problems uh, people are asking for is pensions. And this is really the main problem, pension and uh, health and... Uh, the problems of job also. So uh, maybe the new element 
uh, and compared to other countries is that people are also demanding a new constitution. So maybe we'll have time to talk a little bit about that because it is the, it is the institutional dimension and maybe in the discussion we will, be, we will talk about it regarding the way we get out of the crisis. Yes, is this still on? Can you still hear? Okay, good. Um, just a couple of comments to complement what Emmanuel said. I very often present Chilean data and Chilean issues in the UK, in the United States, in Europe, and elsewhere. And one of the comments that I most frequently hear in response to data like this that I present is, well, we have the same problems in the UK, we have the same problems in the US, we have the same problems in other countries in Europe. Well, yes. If you look at political debates, they're about very many of these things, segmentation and education, um, inequality, etc. But I think the intensity of these phenomena in Chile is, is different, um, and it comes on top of the fact that it is a less developed country, so when you have problems like this, there is no fallback position. Um, I, I, with regard to the inequality data that Emmanuel showed, um, what we showed here is survey data, Gini information, um, from the National Household Survey. Now, one of the key f features of household surveys is that they are a survey and they don't capture the top income levels. So, first of all, the Gini, according to household surveys in Chile in the last few decades, has actually declined quite significantly, quite remarkably, in, in, from, from a very, very high level, but it's declined quite significantly. Now, what happens is when we look at administrative data from the tax authorities, this, of, co of course, does capture real income and also wealth levels. And so when we talk about increased inequality in Chile, what's actually happening is that the top 1% has pulled away from, from the rest in the same way that it has in many um, other developed countries as well, in particular the Anglo-Saxon ones, uh, the US and the UK. So it's, it, th this gap, this wealth gap, and this um, real income gap is growing very, very significantly. Now, mostly the data that we work with is, is from surveys and, and, and is Gini-based. Um, one thing that's important to highlight about Chile is that the pre-tax Gini, the pre-tax income distribution in, in Chile, is actually not that different from many developed countries in Europe. So one example is Portugal, but there are also other countries in Europe that have a pre-tax um, income distribution very similar to Chile's. The difference between Chile and developed countries is that after tax, that Gini comes down by about 15 to 20 points, and that makes a very, very significant difference in terms of how tax is used to redistribute. Um, the tax system in Chile isn't the most redistributive to start with. It's not very equitable. Um, much of it comes from value-added tax, which is um, you know, everyone contributes to that, including the most poor. Um, and so there, there's a lack of equalizing factors, I'd say, in Chile. Um, and this is also echoed by this, the, the, the social spending. So the graph that Emmanuel showed where there's an increase, a significant increase in social spending is absolutely correct, but that's social spending in absolute terms. And a few years ago, we produced a book called Democratic Chile, which looked at the concertación period of governments, which is the period, really, where you would expect the most significant uh, redistribution. And we looked at the relative changes in social expenditure and saw that these did increase when there was an economic crisis, but then kind of drifted back to the sort of average 12% uh, level um, that, that was relatively consistent through the entire period. And I was surprised by this data, and so I went up to a former minister of finance, who is one of the people in the country who most knows about this, and said, does this data look correct to you? Are you surprised by the fact that although absolute levels of social expenditure have gone up, the relative trend is, is pretty much the same over this entire period? And the response I got was basically, yes, it's correct, and you will not publish that table. So um, there was a very clear instruction, which I didn't follow. The table was published in the book. You can all look it up. Um, but it got me into, um, it got me on the shit list. <laughs> <laughs> so the intervention mechanisms, again, um, just, just to say that they don't work. And this is the same thing for um, the process, that, sort of the, the life cycle the Chileans go through. So Diana was showing about the, the, the education, segregation, etc. One of the things that you can predict with almost absolute certainty in Chile is 
if you have a child um, below the age of four, you can pretty much predict where this child will end up with what kind of a job in the labor market with what level of income and what kind of a pension. So where other countries, again, have intervention mechanisms where you have an education system that equalizes this. No education system can make up for the deficiencies of social background, education of the parents, etc. But they can help to level the playing field. And these mechanisms in Chile, of course, given the educational structure, um, or the structure of the educational systems doesn't work very well. There is no real remediation at the education levels within schools. Later, the same inequalities are reproduced at the university levels, then in the labor market. And one of the big problems that you have in Chile is that the skills that people come into the labor market with, either good skills or deficient skills, they remain deficient if there is a problem. So again, within the labor market, there's very little remedial action in terms of investment and skills um, to allow for more mobility in that sense. So I think um, all of this combines to produce basically um, a, a uh, pressure cooker that has now exploded. So the, the protests that Emmanuel was showing um, are all protests and issues that we've seen in recent years. Uh, we've seen spontaneous protests which aren't very easily organized. So, the, for example, the movement for pensions, the Nomatai um, is some it's not that easy to organize pensioners in Chile. This is not Argentina, um, where there are you know, extensive networks uh, that can bring people out into the streets at a drop of a hat. This happened relatively sp spontaneously. So the nature of protests in recent years has changed very significantly, and in large part that has been supported and driven also by a rebirth of civil society, of NGOs, of um, organizations at the grassroots level that come together relatively spontaneously and um, can lead to these social combustions. But probably the distinguishing feature of what we're seeing at the moment is that these protests have been accompanied by levels of violence which have been unseen in democratic Chile. Um, not just the human rights violations, but also the, the, you know, the destruction, the rage that we've observed, um, and, and, and the level of attacks. And this has, of course, been accompanied by a, pretty much a breakdown of law and order. So I think the, the, the protests have revealed also the level of um, incompetence, I think there's no other word for it, with which um, the, the, these protests and this violence um, has been treated and the failure to contain it, the, fa the failure to, to guarantee social peace. Um, I think it's pretty astonishing that after five weeks there have been no meaningful arrests. There have been no credible explanations of how this happened, why this happened, you know, how this was all organized. Um, and of course we have now a whole new record of human rights violations to sort of throw into the mix which are important to discuss as well. Um, this is a very unique comb combination of circumstances. And even though we've been studying at COAS social, social protests for a while now, and we've been following what's been going on, most of us expected some form of social protests under this government. Um, nobody expected this level of violence, however, and, and the accompanying rage uh, that has accompanied these social protests. And I. I'm pretty certain that I speak for my colleagues if I say that nobody expected the social protests to be so extended over the territory, so, so, so universal in the north, in the south, in small towns, in big towns, etc. Um, and also the fact that in Santiago they've moved, and, and in other towns as well, that they've moved into the high income areas. So I understand that this has been a shock to the political elite in, system, uh, in, in Chile. Um, I understand that many of them didn't know how to respond and um, went into probably the same kind of state of catatonic shock that we all experienced when we saw the, the pictures. The problem is how do we get out of this and how do we um, work going forward by bringing people together and thinking about this problem from the center rather than from the extremes. Um, I'm extremely concerned about many of the comments that I see, especially in social networks, but also in the media, also from friends on, ex on both extremes of the political spectrum that seem to be um, referring back to uh, periods of the dictatorship, um, bringing back memories from before, and comments that really are not useful in this context and that incite further violence rather than um, being 
positive and um, moving towards the center to try and bring everybody together to resolve this issue. So with those comments, um, I don't know whether you two have anything to add or I will open this up to debate and to questions. Um, please feel free to ask questions. We have microphones that will be given to you. And please also tell us um, a little bit about yourselves, who you are and where you're from and so on. Thank you. Gentlemen, I'll, I'll bundle questions. There's a gentleman over there and a gentleman over there. Okay, so I've got, yes, and another um, gentleman over there. So three questions to start with. Yeah, my name is Nasser Kalawun. I comment on the news about the Middle East, and you mentioned Lebanon. Um, so I tried, even in public appearances, to compare, though for different reasons, the crisis of neoliberalism in, in all the world, but especially Chile and Lebanon, and that uh, though Chile has uh, copper, as you said, as a man think Lebanon has a promise of gas and oil in the, in the sea. But the difference is um, why the international organizations, IMF, World Bank, whatever, close their eyes in the past. Lebanon is a small country, four million and a half, has uh, external and internal debt up to $85 billion. And now um, state uh, you know, uh, institutions collapsing and exactly similar, you know, and like a high uh, HID or HDI uh, education, whatever, um, uh, but uh, uh, migration or, uh, is encouraged to go outside to find your future, like 50% of youth to go outside to the Arabian Gulf or whatever. <laughs> so what I mean, why the international organization close their eyes for the high debt, number two, what is the case of Chile? I mean, the IMF and others, did they have any opinion to guide or at least, <laughs> you know, uh, find anything with the order or that, uh, uh, you know, no opinion about? Um, there were two questions at the back there. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Jose. I want to start by saying uh, uh, thanks for, for this presentation. Uh, as Chilean, these figures compel us to think more, to act more. And so thank you for that. Uh, I know we have so wide an array of uh, inequalities that it's impossible to mention uh, all, all of this. But um, I, I want to, to ask you about the territorial dimension of inequalities. I know there's, um, after this uh, study by the UNDI uh, GP, the PNUD uh, Desiguales, it came a, a follow-up, I think uh, last year, about uh, regional inequality. Um, we have uh, deep uh, regional inequalities that also relate uh, our bet at the, on, a, on a certain a development strategy that uh, is focused on clusters uh, of, our, of our productive matrix. Mm -hmm. And we also have a very deficient uh, redistributive <laughs> mechanism for redistribution <laughs> uh, within and between regions, that is the National Fund for Regional Development. Um, so uh, what, what's your take on, the, on this territorial dimension? And what can we do not only to send money uh, to the regions, but also to fostering uh, endogenous growth, especially in the context of uh, this decentralization that we are uh, now uh, living in the country. Thanks. And um, yeah. Good evening. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, my name is Arthur. I'm French, and I went on a year abroad in Chile last year, and I worked for a public accelerator called Startup Chile. And you mentioned the fact that the Chilean economy was really monopolistic and that it, wasn't, it couldn't be compared to a really neoliberal country for the fact that you had so much um, concentration of wealth uh, on, different, on very few people. And I was wondering, from researchers' point of view, uh, what would you think of the potential of entrepreneurship to break up these monopolies and to make the country more like fairer again. Who'd like to start with the answers? Uh, I'll take the second one. Okay, go ahead. No, the second one. Oh, you want me to oh okay. Uh, okay. Do you want to go in order? 
I uh, work in the uh, Chilean region, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, your question of the territorial dimension of inequality. Uh, I actually direct a center for uh, economic and regional uh, policy in Viña del Mar. And this is uh, this uh, report by the UN following the desiguales um, is something that is anecdotally, if you ever travel through Chile, it's very easy to see the unequal um, conditions uh, in, in the territory. Uh, and I, I have the privilege of working with someone who is a world expert on, on inequality, Patricia Roca, who has, um, through the years, uh, I've learned that in, in Chile there are no policies to assure any kind of redistribution uh, in regionally. Uh, it, like almost everything in Chile, the model is set up to promote efficiency, which, uh, by the way, I, I, I took down some notes. Um, we didn't spend any time talking about the good, the success part of Chile, which, you know, obviously um, there, there's a lot of growth during the period. And this model of um, letting resources move freely through the country, which, are, which is called uh, people-based, uh, people-place policies, are very efficient. So if you're a very good student from the north, uh, and you get a scholarship to go to the best university in Santiago that is very efficient in terms of allocation of resources. Uh, but the, the problem with that is this high concentration of 45% of the population going to Santiago. Uh, the best students will leave regions, they will go to Santiago to the best universities, and they will never move back. So there, there, is, this, there is a very strong um, regional inequality, even within the metropolitan region, um, anecdotally, during this crisis, I had to go to the doctor in Santiago, and I felt like I drove to another country from Viña del Mar Valparaíso, which was, um, it's a middle-income city, uh, and I drove to the highest income uh, municipality in Chile. I felt like there is nothing happening here. Everything is green. Everything is peaceful. I feel like I'm in the United States. Uh, so th there's sharp contrast and living very close to each other. So someone who works in the south of Santiago in a very uh, barren area without parks, without green, with lots of poverty, will take a bus and in 15, 20 minutes be in areas that are very affluent. So uh, I think that this dimension has not been studied fully yet, uh, but it, is, it does play a role in this discontent of being able to see this contrast. I felt like I had gone the, the impression I had when I went from my city to this part of Santiago to see the doctor was like crossing the border from Mexico to the United States. But there's no borders. We can all move across like in, like in Europe. So these, I think it's a dimension in, in the protest now as well. Um, just to follow up on the territorial dimension, um, there's a big component of this, which is, of course, the economic structure of the Chilean economy and the fact that um, we have areas in which um, you mostly have agriculture and others we have mostly have mining, etc. Um, and, of course, Chile has, as Emmanuel mentioned, um, has never really implemented or even really thought about, I'd say, um, a coherent industrial policy to try and diversify away from... Um, its traditional and historic economic structure. So if you look at the products that Chile exports now, there's very, very little movement up the value chain and there's very little diversification um, from what we've, over, over the last 40 years. Um, having said that, industrial policy is incredibly difficult to undertake successfully and requires an awful lot of resources. Um, I'm personally German and I lived through the whole process of reunification. I've seen how much money Germany has invested in its eastern states, um, probably more than any other economy um, has ever made in terms of the effort to diversify, industrialize, and overcome regional inequalities. Um, the eastern German states, after 20 years now, are, no, sorry, 30 years, are now at 75% of the western GDP level. So that's a tremendous achievement. And yet people in those regions, as many of you probably know, vote very differently, have very different expectations, and feel very much left behind. So this is not an easy issue to resolve. Having said that, Chile has no mechanisms for any kind of territorial redistribution 
not even the municipalities within Santiago. There is a fund for municipal redistribution, but it's so minimal as to have virtually no impact. So again, um, the social services provided by a municipality like Vitacura or Las Condes are a world away from those um, from the poorer districts within the same city. The um, research that we undertake at COES includes um, geographical information from the um, Center for Territorial Intelligence at the Universidad Adolfo Ibáñez, and we have detailed information and maps that we can show you or that you can see on our website about how various different services, economic indicators, etc., are distributed um, across Chile, we work with 23 cities, the, the largest 23 cities in Chile, and it's the same picture pretty much everywhere. These cities are incredibly highly segregated, um, very much following the model of Santiago with very little mixture um, across the territories. And again, with no, no real effort at the public policy level to redistribute and address these issues. Um, since I talked about the economic structure, um, I'll also take the question about Startup Chile and, and the potential of entrepreneurship to, to break up these traditional structures. Um, yes, there is the potential for them. The only Chilean company, but maybe I'm missing something here, maybe you can help me, the only Chilean company that I can think of that produced a unique product which it then managed to... Um, export and make us an international success story of is Lagunas Cristalinas, the big um, um, pools that were first constructed in San Alfonso del Mar and which are now being built all over the world. That technology is uniquely Chilean, was developed in Chile, tested in Chile, and is being exported elsewhere. I can't think of any other examples of this kind of level of... Um, entrepreneurship that started in Chile and was exported somewhere else. So the potential is, of course, always there. Um, I'm, there. There are very mixed views on how successful the Startup Chile program has been, but it's very difficult to break up traditional monopolies and traditional economic conglomerates run by the same families over you know, decades um, by means of a, an entrepreneurship program, be it a startup program or be it even industrial policy that you know, strengthens um, smaller companies, etc. I mean, the, the, the big economic power in Chile is, this is one of the problems, is very much concentrated into very few hands. Um, and those hands have a tremendous influence on policy making in Chile at all levels. So whether it's the IFPs, um, the, the other thing is that this is of course all interconnected. So you have IFPs that belong to the same families, you have um, the industrial firms that belong to the same families, and the, you know this replicates itself across the entire um, ch all levels of Chilean society. Whether it's education, universities, uh, healthcare systems, uh, clinics, it's all vertically integrated, and um, the system is pretty much designed to make as much money out of you as it can. And then that money is concentrated in very few um, industrial holding companies. So it's very, very difficult to break that up. And there would have to be a very concerted and very, uh, policy to, to break this up. And that, of course, would be politically um, very much resisted. That leaves the international organizations question. You want I would just like to add to your, your comment uh, regarding the question about monopolies that um, Coming from, uh, I moved to Chile from the United States where I grew up, and it's very interesting, or, or it's always been a puzzle to me, uh, the lack of real antitrust regulation uh, that exists in every developed country in the world. Uh, no one is exempt, not even the richest man in the world, Bill Gates, you know, from um, some reg form of regulation of predatory uh, collusion, price fixing uh, behavior. And in Chile, it is very much the norm. Uh, there was a very, very um, tragic, I would say, case uh, with the uh, chicken industry where the three major companies that produce poultry would gather and meet every month to fix prices. That was the objective of the meeting, where it, it, I saw a, um, an expert in antitrust law comment about this. In the United States, the FBI will send people into rooms. These meetings take place in very dark, creepy motels because people know it's illegal, and they will send in secret agents to record them. In Chile, it was happening. People were getting emails, getting invited to these meetings in the light of day. 
uh, that in the law is illegal without any kind of bite, any kind of real power by the, the government or interest to, to regulate such price-fixing behavior. So along with maybe entrepreneurship, I think that the country would benefit from studying other countries that have real laws to prevent price-fixing behaviors. The reason medicines are so expensive in Chile is because there are two or three major laboratories that fix prices. They give uh, doctors bribes to give their patients you know, orders to go get their medicines, and then the pharmacies collude on the markup. So it's, it's very much price-fixing illegal behavior that has not been regulated. The same incident extends to the financial sector. I had a very somewhat amusing interview with a, a journalist from the Mercurio last week who asked me whether the hope of Chile becoming the regional leader of financial services was, had now gone down the drain with these social protests. So my first reaction, of course, was, that's what you're worried about when you know, the whole country's <laughs> <laughs> exploding in, in, in conflict, etc.? Um, but of course, yes, one of the discussions uh, you know, in that context is can you even think about constructing a financial services center for the region in a country which suffers from this level of um, lack of regulation and collusion? And when you read some of the opinions about uh, international investors who work with Chile, you know, that the, they laugh at the level of regulation. So there's much to be done at every level of the Chilean economy, but of course at the moment the urgency is the level of social protest that has to be dealt with first. So about your question, I'm sorry, I'm, I really don't know anything about the Middle East. I just know that uh, the uprise in Lebanon was, the, the timing was almost perfect with, with Chile. Uh, we share two <laughs> problems, um, corruption, I understand, and um, the way the uprise began, well in Chile it was with the subway and in your case it was uh, the tax with WhatsApp, I understand. Uh, so, that's all I know. I'm sorry about that. But regarding uh, what you were asking about international organizations, I mean, for about 40 years, Latin American countries don't believe in what the IMF would say. I mean, Latin American countries have had the worst experiences with uh, recommendations. Uh, Argentina, our neighbor, um, well, it's just up and down, up and down, and they're just, they don't comply with what the IMF uh, says. So we have a really uh, difficult relationship with some of these uh, international organizations. And I like to say too that the, one of the problems we have right now, maybe it's not that, uh, um, there is no direct relation with what's happening in Chile, but it's the commercial war between the US and China. And I understand that about that, uh, the United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank, uh, just, or the um, in, international commercial um, uh, organization, they just can't do anything, or very, they have a low, very low level of response to, to that. And Chile is just in between uh, the US and China. China is investing a lot in, in Chile. Uh, for lithium, for copper, and uh, strategic uh, sectors of the economy. Uh, but we are the patio trasero, the uh, backyard Back, yeah. of uh, the US, historically. So there is a huge dispute coming now. And I think we don't really see what's going to happen in the next 10 or 20 years. I mean, we're all focused on the climate change, too. But there is something happening in Chile right now that has to uh, be related to the commercial, commercial war between the U.S. between the U.S. And, and China. And China is investing in Latin America, and in the U.S. they're not quite happy about that. So maybe that's part of the answer. I'm, I'm sorry if I don't have many other. Um, sorry, just to finish on that question about the IMF, on the 5th of December, Jose Antonio Campo will be coming to the LSE, and his talk will be specifically about an IMF for the 21st century. And he is one of the sharpest, brightest economists I know who knows an awful lot about international institutions. That question, really, he'll be able to answer it much better than we can. 
Um, so next questions. Um, I'm going to look to this side of the room. <laughs> One, <laughs> two, three. Can we take those three questions on that side, please? Have you got any data to share with us by income quintile on ethnicity on the one hand and on the other hand Could you speak louder please uh, share with us data by income quintile by <laughs> ethnicity is my first question my second question is uh, immigration so for example how many were born in Chile and how many were born in neighboring countries yes Um, hi, my name is Gisela. I'm from Brazil, and um, it felt like you were basically presenting about my country as well, uh, unfortunately. Um, and I realized that something that's very common in Latin America, and you were sort of touching upon that, is government seems to be so scared of um, international money leaving the country that it seems like no reforms can be made in terms of um, tax. So you can't tax fortunes, you can't, um, you can't tax progressively because then the investors will, um, will move away. You can't have more regulations and anti-cartel uh, like and anti-price establishing things because that will happen as well. You can't have pensions and you need to have work uh, labor reforms so that um, it's appealing for investors. So. Um, my question is, what would you say to this, considering that every developed country has uh, moved forward in these terms, and in Latin America, this is still an acceptable uh, discourse to uh, put off reform? Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel. Um, I came from uh, Sussex University. I've uh, been studying this year uh, corruption at the local level in Chile. And, well, thank you first for your presentation. Uh, I was thinking about the, the local sphere in Chile. Um, it seems that um, uh, one of the effects of inequality in the long run, especially in the capacity of municipalities, is weakness. No? And, uh, but actors don't stay, uh, uh, like, they, they don't do nothing. They, they create these informal institutions at the local level mm -hmm. to confront inequality. And, <clears throat> like, we see an example like clientelism, many things that happen at the local sphere. And so we have this approach of Chile, like a highly Weberian, sorry, legalistic go uh, state. But we see at the local level in Chile, it's highly personalistic, highly informal. And that's, that's the thing, is, is, is paradigmatic, because this government thinks that we can create more laws and more laws, but they don't want to work in the local area, that they have this personal connection with people. And I feel that the local sphere is really neglected. You know? So you mentioned a little bit of this centralism, that is also a big variable of the, of the issue. So when you comment a little bit about the solutions, you know, or how we can work with, with this uh, capital that mayors, for example, or local, go local communities have, to give a solution for this. Yeah. Sorry, I've a bit. Yeah, yeah. Confused. We're kind of smiling at each other because you, you ask a very important question that Emmanuel has a research project on, on informal institutions in Chile that we've both worked on. So the expert <laughs> on the topic is sitting at the table. But Nick, is, um, I'll start to take the questions in order. Um, the first one is actually the quickest. Um, data on ethnicity, yes, is available. It's not always available in the way we would want it because uh, the question hasn't always been included. And with immigration, the issue is even is worse in a sense. Um, we have Chilean household surveys have been asking about ethnic, ethnic categories for longer. Uh, and only very recently started asking questions about immigration. I think we're quite fortunate that in these protests, immigration hasn't been a topic. So it's, it's almost a miracle that these protests haven't lashed out against immigrants as taking away jobs and, and sort of um, worsening the situation of, of Chile's most disp dispossessed. Um, but overall, immigrants in Chile, from the research that I've undertaken, I mostly look at labor markets, but there are so many other areas that are connected to labor markets. Um, immigrants insert themselves, with the exception of Haitians, they accept, accept, insert themselves into the sort of middle of the labor market. They do quite well. Uh, and they certainly do better than the lower income quintiles in Chile. So think about them as sort of starting at the 50% mark 
um, roughly both in terms of income and employment conditions, and of course their levels of participation are much higher and unemployment is much lo lower, and they have a completely different set of expectations relative to the local Chilean population. But so far the um, discourse on immigration has been quite contained in Chile, given the level of immigration that has occurred and the, the number of people that have come into the country in recent years. So, so far, um, I think we've been quite lucky with that topic. The, these protests could very easily have turned against immigrants among one of the things um, that they were fighting against. Um, just very quickly also, the um, question about international money leaving and, in, and governments in, in, in Latin America generally being fearful of regulating where, whatever the sector or whatever the issue and taxing. Um, I think probably by the time these protests are over and we get in the economic statistics and we see how much these protests will have affected economic growth and uh, growth rates and investment rates in Chile, that might bring a, about a change in how people think about that because with this level of inequality, ultimately the economic cost can be very, very high. We do know from international studies, I mean, finally even the IMF came out and said this in 2014, that high levels of inequality are bad for economic development and growth. So um, what most of us have su su suspected over a long time, even the IMF came out and said it in 2014 and did multinational studies on it. Um, th but the discourse of international institutions to flexibilize, to deregulate, to be as liberal as possible, really went deep into Latin American policymaking debates and how people think about policymaking. And much of that is to blame. So at the end of the day, the idea that that over-flexibilizing, deregulating has a cost, hasn't really sunk in. But these protests will, certainly in Chile, will bring that lesson home and you can see a real shift in how people, how, how um, uh, the business sector is talking about these protests as an economic cost and that they have to dig deeper into their pockets, they have to pay more taxes, etc. And that this current level of social indicator is not sustainable in the long run because it will affect economic growth negatively. Do you want to add something to those questions before we move on to? Sure. Um, I just wanted to. I believe that the 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 level of Im immigration in Chile is is quite low, even despite or con including the the recent wave of immigration from Colombia and from Venezuela. I believe it is around no more than ten or maybe. 11% of the population is foreign-born. The last time I checked, maybe it has gone up a little bit. It's the same level as the UK. Same level as the UK. I think there are other countries, though, in Europe where it's a bit higher. Mm -hmm. um, and poverty is concentrated, or there, there are high levels of poverty, uh, very high in indigenous uh, populations. In Chile, it's the poorest region of the country with poverty rates um, much higher than the national average for the first uh, question. I don't have the, the number in mind, but... Um, and regarding the question about reforms and fear of uh, capital flight by inter international investors, there are a lot of commonalities, I believe, in the production structures, the common history that binds Latin American countries. But one big difference that Chile has with other countries of Latin America is that it does not have a program with the IMF. Uh, due to, I believe this is you know, where not everything is negative, but the, the, the very high level of technical um, management of the country has made it so that with the copper boom, I think the, the dean of the uh, public uh, policy school here, Andres Velasco, was one of the designers of a, of a, they call it in English, a rainy days fund. So the, the high uh, benefits of the copper boom years were saved so that the country does not have a debt program with the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, which is very different from other Latin American countries. So I come originally, my family's from Nicaragua, where it was almost entirely dependent on foreign aid during the 1990s to reconstruct after a decade of civil war, where these um, policies to deregulate, to privatize, were sort of imposed from the outside. In Chile, it has been a result of um, the decision made in the mid-80s with the Pinochet dictatorship to opt for uh, this model, this economic model, much before other countries. So th I think there is a difference because Chile has a choice. Chilean society today has a choice of which way do, I, I say we because I live in Chile, I'm not going anywhere um, yet, uh, but um, 
the, 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 we have a choice as a society, whereas maybe in, in Nicaragua, in Brazil, in other countries, you know, you're, you're from Brazil, uh, you don't have a choice in the policy making decisions as a society because you owe so much money, like Argentina, you know, which is up and down, one bailout after another, and so on. So I think that is very, very different because the quality of institutions and decision making, even despite everything that is happening today uh, in Chile, I, I hope that it doesn't erode um, what the country has in terms of macroeconomic management and thinking ahead and, and not spending all the money uh, that was saved during the copper boom years. Uh, Venezuela is the other example with having gone through ye decades of very high uh, oil prices, spent all the money. So, um, Just to add, those of you who followed the earthquake in 2010, that led to a reconstruction program. Um, and what's interesting is that the government relatively quickly concluded that what was going to be needed after this social crisis was a reconstruction program. And Chile does have the funds to do this. So uh, overall, I think one of the things that is important to sort of keep a perspective of this, I know Chile is in the middle of a crisis, but before we all he head home to our antidepressants about this, there are some very positive highlights. And overall, Chile has generally undertaken policies in the right direction. It hasn't always done enough. We've we obviously got to this situation. Um, but much of what we're seeing now is also that the social change has probably outpaced the capacity of governments to respond to development that occurs so quickly that it happens before you've even gathered the data on it. So one of the big issues that we have in Latin America is always having enough data to, find, to, to, to really analyze what's going on. That takes years to implement. And sometimes these social changes happen more quickly than you actually can even measure. And so in a way, what we're seeing now is as much a result of the positive development process that Chile has had, as well as an indicator of the fact that not everything has gone right. But overall, I think the Chilean economy and the Chilean development process um, has been positive thanks to its government unlike other countries in Latin America, which are much, much more wealthy in terms of their natural resource endowment and have functioned in spite of their governments. So that's an important distinction to make in the region. Um, okay. Uh, well, regarding the um, question about corruption and the local level, uh, yes, everybody knows in Chile that the main problem right now about corruption is in the highest part of the society, but also on the municipality level. And uh, I suppose you remember that uh, in 2015 we had a major uh, political scandal uh, when we discovered that uh, the major firms in Chile funded uh, political uh, campaigns, but from all parties. Uh, but the good news regarding what uh, Kirsten was saying is that it was not for, I don't know how you call that, personal enrichment. I mean, it was not as other countries in Latin America. It was to fund political campaigns, uh, not uh, for personal uh, enrichment, how do you call yeah. that? Enrichment. Enrichment? Yeah, enrichment. So that's the good news uh, comparing other countries. Uh, but the bad news is that the uh, commission that was formed in 2015 uh, uh, after these scandals decided not to look at the municipal level because there was so much to do. I mean, at some point you have to select uh, and prioritize. And the Bachelet government had so many reforms uh, on its hands, it was health, education, pension, so they had to choose, and that's the way Engel puts it, the one who presided the commission. Well, we had so much to do that uh, the local level would, uh, could wait. And uh, recently, before the outburst, and uh, from last year, we've been uh, discussing an integrity law, um, which was uh, a way of understanding that there was a problem and the political class was beginning to think about uh, poverty in uh, the public service. Uh, but they also decided that the local level was not the priority. So now they will have to think about it because of poverty at the local level. Uh, but 
I've always been puzzled uh, in Chile about this idea that there is a Viberian state, and that's right, we don't have the levels of corruption uh, with the political uh, class that we have with the economic elite. Uh, but we know that uh, people help one another uh, with informal institutions, and it's the same on the uh, political level. We know that Latin America has the uh, lowest levels of interpersonal and institutional trust. So you don't trust anybody and you don't trust even your family. I mean, that's what uh, 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 social uh, surveys show. So you help yourself, you help your family, your friends, and that's a cultural dimension of the relationship between people that we have to think about too, and that's one of the uh, reflections we have to have on the process about the Constitution. Will it be the same? Will it be negotiated openly? Will it be negotiated between four uh, walls? That's one of the main questions, but the good news is that corruption has not affected that much the political class. So I know that politicians are really low rated, but I don't think they deserve it in Chile, really. <laughs> I agree. Being from uh, Nicaragua, very corrupt. <laughs> right, we have a bit of a dilemma. It's 8 o'clock. I, I know that there are an awful lot more questions in the room, so the question really to you is we don't have to vacate the room. If you would like to continue asking questions, we can keep going. Um, but don't feel obliged. <laughs> if you need to leave, that's fine. Um, the question is would you like to keep going because it is 8 o'clock. Are there more burning questions? <laughs> There's a burning question over there. <laughs> or, or maybe just... Or maybe we can just... As, if you wish to go, you can go. Yeah, and, and then maybe have... Just feel free to approach us with questions that you have outstanding. Okay? Have a good evening. <laughs> <laughs>